When I was a young Christian, especially when I was in university, I was often confronted with questions about my view of human origins and the, and the world in general. There are those who will make arguments in favor of some sort of big bang in which the cosmos exploded in a blind scatter of inanimate lumps. As somebody has said, if life is only a fortuitous concourse of atoms, our world must be a dangerous place. And there are those who will say that humanity evolved from apes and monkeys, and there are those who will say that the world is created by God and that humanity was created by God as part of that process. And I want to suggest to you that each one of those arguments requires a lot of faith. Each one of them. The scientific community is working on the basis of faith as much as the church is. But I have to admit, I have really never had a horse in this race. I'm quite comfortable with the Genesis account of creation, which we read earlier, because I believe God's word is true. But to me, the how of creation is less important than the why and the by whom of creation. That is, how we got here matters less to me than who made us and our world and why we were made. I leave it to the scientifically minded Christians to bat around the how of creation. Those details are not important to me, and I don't think they need to be important to you unless you have a particularly scientifically minded interest in the subject. When I think, what I think you should be concerned about is who made the world and why the world was made. These are big questions to which the Bible gives unequivocal answers. In the New Testament, the creation story is not just assumed, it is expounded upon. Jesus assumes the truth of Genesis 1 when he talks about creation, and even when he talks about marriage. And if you ever wondered who the us and our in the Genesis 1 creation story is, Paul writes a beautiful poem, the Apostle Paul, and he writes this in Colossians chapter 1 to explain it. Now, Colossians is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote along with Timothy to the church in a small city in Colossae, uh, which is now part of Turkey. He was in prison in Rome at the time that he wrote. And his purpose was to correct false teaching that was spreading, particularly having to do with the place and identity of Jesus Christ in their salvation and in their community. Colossians is my favorite book in the Bible. And in no small part, it's because of the passage that we're going to read today. Uh, many scholars view this poem as an early Christian hymn that Paul drew together from Genesis chapter 1 and from that verse in Proverbs chapter 8 with which we opened worship today. In this poem, Paul answers the question of the use of the first person plural in Genesis chapter 1. This is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. We're going to stop right there for a second because you might ask how something invisible can have an image. Well, in Greek philosophy, with which Colossians would have been familiar, the image reveals the reality. As we understand it, that doesn't mean that images of Jesus from Solomon's head of Christ to David C. Cook Bible in Life pics necessarily show us what God looks like exactly or even what Jesus looked like when he wandered the dusty paths of ancient Palestine. But the image that's conjured by Paul's words here in Colossians 1 point to what we can know about what God is like because we have a divinely revealed understanding of Jesus. The great New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce once said that all the attributes and activities of God are disclosed in Christ. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Paul continues by saying he existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Literally, that says that Jesus was the firstborn over all creation, but it's not about birth order or createdness. It's about status. It distinguishes Jesus from all created things. Verse 16. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. 
He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. That verb holds together it implies that everything over the creation's existence is in Christ. He is the basic operating principle controlling all cosmic existence. New Testament scholar Charlie Mole once said, he keeps the cosmos from becoming chaos. I like that turn of phrase. He keeps the cosmos from becoming chaos. Christ is the glue that holds creation together. After all, he was present at creation. Then Paul gets practical, bringing the cosmic down to earth. Verse 18, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This cosmic creator, Christ, is brought down to earth by the cross through both the cost of his blood and the violence of the cross. Verse 21 starts with, this includes you who were once far away from God. Far away refers to being alienated, isolated, lonely, having a deep sense of not belonging. Jesus, creator by his blood on the cross, reunites us with God and takes away that alienation, that sense of being far from God. How have we been alienated? We've been alienated by sin. Sin makes us enemies of God. Paul continues, You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless. That's unblemished. That's, that's sacrifice, animal sacrifice language. You are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. We need to just park on that for a second. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, by faith, we stand before the Lord of heaven's armies without a single fault. If that doesn't put a spring in your step today, I don't know what could. Jesus has made it so that our relationship with God is restored. It's separated by sin and restored by the cross. Verse 23. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. In other words, stick with Jesus. Continue to worship in community. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. Now, in this series, we're talking about the air we breathe, a foundation for Christian worldview. And one of the key parts of a Christian worldview is understanding that God created the world and created humanity in his own image. We don't have to understand how. We just have to understand that he did this. And it's important to know that the Lord Jesus Christ the whole, and the Holy Spirit, they were present in the acts of creation. That is, to believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord is to believe in Jesus as creator. Several years ago, Diana and I were celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary, and we decided to do something that wouldn't be expected of a lot of pastors. We went to Vegas. Never gambled a cent. House made no money off us. Uh, when we go to Vegas, it's primarily to people watch, and heaven knows there's lots of that to take in. But because that first time we were so close and, and our bodies were still on Eastern time, we decided that we would, when we got to the airport, we'd rent a car and the next morning 
we'd get up, because we'd be up early, inevitably, and we'd go to the Grand Canyon, four-hour drive away. And uh, so, as predicted, five o'clock the next morning, we were awake, got up, got in the car, we watched the sun rise over the Hoover Dam, and we headed across the dangerous US-93 toward the Grand Canyon. It was a sight to behold. It was August. Kids were back in school, not many people around. It was actually cooler in the Grand Canyon or at the, the, at the top of the South Rim than it was in, in the city. And we were able to walk right up to the edge. And that astounded me. In the land of litigation, that you could just freely walk right off the precipice of the Grand Canyon. And there was one young man who was a little more daring than me. I have a bit of a fear of heights, so I wasn't very close to the edge, the edge. But this young guy, he was sitting on this little jutted out piece of rock taking selfies. Diana took this picture just in case the forensic examiners would need it later on. But we didn't hear anything on the radio, so we surmised that he may have survived. But it... it Nerves of steel, I suppose, or a brain of mush. I'm not sure which that was. But anyway, I looked at the massive canyon and the, the, what appeared to be the tiny Colorado River below, which is definitely not tiny. And I looked at this and I understand how glaciers operated and various geological phenomena work. But my one comment was this. That was a big hole Jesus made. I'm sure there are some who would mock a statement like that as foolishness, but I was simply affirming what the Apostle Paul was saying in Colossians 1.16. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. Now, if I'd visited the interpretive center, which we did not, uh, I'm sure I would have heard a scientific explanation for how this massive wonder of the world came to be. And I'm sure that that would not have included something about Jesus having created it through his death and resurrection and all things that he did. This Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose from the dead, also was the creator. But I am prepared to believe by faith that even by the scientific means we understand today, Jesus was active in making the Grand Canyon. Is that a statement of faith? It is. But so is the statement that Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for sin. In fact, many would say it's easier to believe in Jesus' role in the atonement than it is to believe he was active in creation. But Colossians 1 affirms his complete humanity and his complete divinity. Human words limit the ability to express this, but it is a statement of faith. The poem Paul wrote here flows from creation to redemption, but we understand it only backwards, from redemption back to creation. That's why I suggest when you read the Bible that you start with the Gospel of John, then read the New Testament, then read the whole thing, because it makes much more sense if you understand God's eternal purpose in salvation, creation makes a lot more sense. I don't know if you're a note taker or not, but you know, if, if you've got a, a pencil, a pen, a, a, a pin, you know, to prick it in blood, whatever you have to do, I want you to write this down. The same creative power that triumphed on the cross creates and sustains our world. The same creative power that triumphed on the cross creates and sustains our world. One scholar said, what is pre-existent is not Christ in person, but the power of God that came to be active in him. So, just as an example, uh, when the prime minister was born in 1971, at that time, we know he was not the prime minister. The person we now know was not, uh, the person we now know was born then. And the person we know in Jesus, the Messiah, was God's pre-existent agent in creation. A Jewish person, you understand, would never say that Jesus was active in creation because the average Jewish person does not grasp or even believe in Jesus born in the first century as Messiah. 
They don't believe he's any way connected to God, but any who claim to know God and do not recognize God in Jesus Christ do not know the true God. So Christians believe that the same Jesus who went to the cross and rose from the dead had that same power prior to his incarnation as the eternal Son of God. That's why we have all these New Testament allusions to Jesus in the Old Testament as well. Jesus was present and active in creation. He was present and active in the life of ancient Israel. J.B. Phillips used to say in the middle of the 20th century that we see our God as too small. And sometimes I think we understand Jesus as being too small. He wasn't a political revolutionary. He wasn't a messianic schemer. He wasn't a Galilean holy man or a wandering peasant. Jesus is the Lord. He is Savior. He is Creator. To believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior is to believe in Jesus as Creator. To have a Christian worldview is to believe that this world, even the entire universe, did not come into being by chance, but by the gracious creative hand of God. And we know that God in the person in the Lord Jesus Christ. One scholar said Christ brings clarity to our hazy notions of the immortal, invisible God. We're made in God's image, to be sure, but the Son is the only satisfactory likeness of the Father, the perfect image of God. Not because he was a good teacher, not because he was male, not because he said profound things. He is the only satisfactory likeness of the Father because Jesus is God. Now, you might be thinking by now, is this message about creation or about Jesus? The answer is yes. They are entwined. A biblical view of creation and a biblical view of Jesus are connected. Now you might be wondering why Paul introduced the church into this poem. He states that in Jesus all things hold together. And then he says that Christ is the head of the church, the body of Christ. Why the jump? Well, if Christ the creator is the head of the church, that means that the destinies of creation and the church are bound together and that God's purposes for all creation gestate in the church's congregational life. In short, the church is a sort of microcosm of the whole creation, and that should inspire us to want to be the church with greater excellence. Because, well, let's be honest, the church in general these days is facing some difficult times. Between moral failures and doctrinal divides, society is finding more and more reason to cast off the church as irrelevant. But the church has a place and will have a place in society until Jesus comes again, not least because it is a sign of God's creative effort. And it reminds us that just as in the church we need each other, neither is the universe self-sufficient, no matter what the deists might say. Neither individuals nor the universe can function completely independently. We need each other to survive. But the church, like the world, is fallen. It awaits the consummation when it will be drawn into complete harmony with the Father. This was accomplished in the death and resurrection of Jesus, and it will be completed in his return. And this is not plan B. It's not plan B. God's plan from the beginning of creation was to reconcile all things to himself through Jesus Christ. And that plan has not changed. Jesus, the Son, is supreme. That shows itself today most visibly in the church as the church should be, living first and foremost for the Lord. See, as the church, we do not exist. Don't miss it. We do not exist to meet the needs of our members. We don't exist to ensure institutional survival. We exist to fulfill the redemptive purpose of Christ, our head. As the Westminster Shorter Catechism says, our chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. He needs to be the center. 
To believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord is to believe in Jesus as creator of all things. That's part of what it means to have a Christian worldview. It'd be easy to get deep in the weeds in this stuff, right? Talk about whether we believe in a creation that happened over seven literal 24-hour days or whether God's creation is compatible with any kind of evolution and so on. But I want to suggest that getting deeper in the weeds on the matter of creation is not as important as acknowledging that God in Christ has made the universe for his purpose. And we as people have a role to play. We are the church he is the head. God reconciled us to himself in his death and resurrection. And these aren't just theological tenets that we leave for the scholars in the ivory towers. These are important parts of what it means to have a Christian view on life. These are the, among the moral absolutes to which we hold. These are the beliefs that we learn through the scriptures, God's word to us, which is the lens through which we understand the world. Let me just leave you with one more thought. The Christian faith is a world-affirming faith. You might think, boy, you talk smack about the world an awful lot, Jeff, to say that. And that's true. But we can be reminded that Jesus famously said that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He cares for us. Being found on such a minor planet in such a vast universe, how could it be otherwise? The Christian faith affirms that the world is good when rightly understood. We understand that salvation is not found in trying to escape the world or escape the body. God has placed us here for a purpose. We, the church, are a microcosm of what God intends the world to be. And that begins by being centered on Christ, our creator. One scientist described the scientific search for meaning as scaling the mountain of ignorance and climbing the highest peak, the beginning of time. And at the top, there was a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. By this, he didn't mean that theologians had everything figured out. But it was an acknowledgement that we are dealing with a mystery that humans will never fully explain. And at the center of that mystery is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why seeking comfort from something people call the universe, you know, hear people, you know I, the universe wants me to have this, or the universe. Anytime somebody says something like that, just take them to Jesus. Help that person see that there is a personal creator who not only created the world, created the church too, to point people to himself. To believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior is to believe in Jesus as creator. That's part of what it means to have a Christian worldview. And that's something that you can take to your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends, your family, and show them that this Jesus who died for their sins, who rose again from the dead to bring eternal life, also created this world that we enjoy. And he invites us to steward that mystery and this world for his honor. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, creator of all things, in you and in you alone does this world hold together. Thank you. Thank you for what Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. It's so rich, so full of meaning that a hundred different sermons could be proclaimed solely through this passage we have shared today. Thank you for making the world and for making us in your image. Give us grace to proclaim your love to a world that is deeply fallen. We long for the day when you will return and bring full redemption to the created order in your sovereign way. You will bring this to pass. So give us the fruit of your spirit, which is patience, while we labor to make you known and loved and served, starting with our own community. Amen. If you're curious to know more about what it means to have Jesus as Savior and Lord and Creator, 
I invite you to make use of the connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect, or you who are here can speak to me after, and we can have a conversation about what God's doing in the world and in your life. To believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior is to believe in Jesus, the Creator.